Hi folks, welcome to the Green School celebration of National Biodiversity Week. We are delighted to have you with us. Today's talk is focusing on birds and bird care. The plan for the talk today is to give some very general advice to begin about gardening for wildlife. We will then look at some particular species of birds that are happy to live in and around school grounds and in suburban areas. Finally then, I will summarise with some key things to consider relating to bird care, specifically the do's and don'ts of feeding birds and some general notes on nest boxes too. To begin, my main message is that the best way to look after all of our wildlife is to provide natural habitat. So that means lots of tree cover, shrub cover, natural hiding places like ivy cover, bramble, dense thickets and natural wild areas where food is found plentifully. Now, obviously, that is not always possible. So if we just don't have the right space for growing big trees and shrubs, we may have to intervene and provide some other food and artificial hiding places. Now, there's no one size that fits all. So you see every animal and every bird species is specifically designed to get food in a particular manner. Each bird species has a preferred type of food and not all birds eat seeds and not all birds eat earthworms, for example. So we need to understand what kind of birds we are trying to look after on our school grounds and which ones do we really want to work hard to promote and protect. My advice here is to start by seeing what birds come in and out of your garden already and then decide which bird species you could start to care for and then build it up, adding new species as time goes by. So what I'm going to do today is go through a few of the bird species that we already know are generally happy to live in school gardens. And we will use these birds as a starting point because we know they're happy to live in and around those kind of suburban or urban spaces. I'll give you a few pointers on how to recognize these birds and what they like in their habitat or places where they live. And you might pick out one or two that you think really like to spend time at your school or in your gardens. And after this talk, then over the next few weeks or months, you can go about learning more about them and making changes to your landscape at school to help them to survive and thrive there. Let's start with this guy. Who do you think this is? That's right, it's a robin, one of our more common species. It's very friendly. And if you ever notice when you're out digging in the garden at school or at home, one of these little guys might come and sit on the wall beside you to watch. What they're especially watching for is little grubs that you might turn over as you're digging in the soil. So these birds prefer to eat little insects and invertebrates, more so than seeds, for example. So if you do decide that you want to really look after your robins, the best food to put out for them on a bird table would be mealworms. Now, who's this? Well done. It's a blackbird. You might have seen it just flit away at the top left of the screen at the end there. There was a lot of bird song in that clip and you could probably hear some blackbirds further away as well as the one that sang a couple of times up close. The picture at the top is of a male blackbird. He's got a lovely yellow beak 
uh, yellowy orange beak and a yellowy orange ring around his eye. And his feathers are pretty much dark black. The female, the other one in the, in the screen in front of you, is a more brown color overall and doesn't have the same coloration on the beak or the eye. Like most female birds, she is more dull or drab and matches the surroundings a bit better. This is so that when she's sitting on her nest, she's not easy to spot. So blackbirds love a lawn. They love short grass so that they can dig in the soil and pull out earthworms and other invertebrates. They also love digging and picking through leaf litter. So when all the leaves in the autumn fall and they make a kind of a carpet under the trees, it's a really good place to find invertebrates. So that's where the earthworms and other grubs and insects hang out. And it's a really good spot for the birds to find food. So throughout the year, blackbirds can be found in those areas, but especially in the autumn then, when bushes are full of fruit and apple trees are full of apples, these birds will hang out in those areas then and eat a lot of fruit. So if you can collect and spread fallen leaves in autumn and use them to cover any areas in your school grounds, such as flower beds, that would be great. It would create a great habitat for these birds to feed in. Planting fruit trees is also a good option if you can, or even just leaving out fruit on your bird table will help these birds. Now, who is this? If you pay attention to the center of the picture at the moment, there is a little bird perched up on a wire. It's not making the usual call for this bird, but hopefully this bird's behavior and where it flies to into a nest site might give you a clue as to what bird it is. Did you get it right? It's a starling. Believe it or not, starlings are one of our endangered species in Ireland now because of recent population declines. They're on the amber list of birds of conservation concern. So did you notice during that short clip that when the bird with the food in its beak flew across and went up under the eaves of the roof, you then could hear screeching or squawking. And that, of course, was because the parent bird had landed into the nest where it had several chicks waiting to be fed. And I suppose each chick was kind of saying, feed me, feed me, no, feed me, to the parent all at the one time, all hungry little chicks. They'll probably be fledging in a week or two. Judging by the noise, they seem like they're ready to go already. So starlings, are not too fussy with what they eat. They generally eat a lot of grubs from the soil. So that would be um, the larvae of beetles and flies that live under the grass. So things like leather jackets. Leather jackets is another name for the larvae of daddy long legs flies. And they generally feed under the soil on grass roots, for example. So the starling probes its beak into the ground, sticks its beak into the ground or long grass, and uses its beak to prise open holes and small spaces to bury and dig and find in the soil um, anything that's living and tasty. So that's for a lot of the year round they would do that digging in the soil but they also then in the autumn time gorge on berries. They're really gregarious that means that they live in large flocks they're really really social they love spending time with lots of friends so you often get large flocks of these birds coming into land at one time. So really they can do a lot of damage or good, depending on your perspective, in terms of cleaning up berries off a tree. 
If a big flock lands, it might only take a few minutes before all the ripe berries are gone, and then they'll move on to the next tree. So they're really not fussy about what they eat. And so if you want to protect and help these birds, all you need to do is keep your table, bird table, well stocked up. They'll also use a nest site, a, a suitable nest site, which we'll talk about later, if you put one out. So that's another way you could possibly help these guys. Now, next bird. Do you know who this is? Well done. It is a blue tit. Now, these little fellows flit up and down branches and twigs looking for tasty invertebrates. They call regularly, so they're pretty easy to hear and to spot. I'm going to play you another little video of these birds feeding. Watch their behaviour. Do you notice how they land at the tips of the branches? They can go right up onto the twigs. A heavy bird would not be able to feed just there. What do you think it's doing? It's searching for invertebrates, spiders, little caterpillars, flies, any little creatures that live out on the boughs and the branches of the tree. See how it clings upside down? So that's the blue tit. They take readily to nest boxes, so if you put the right nest box out, it is very likely that it will nest in it. They often have lots of chicks in each brood, so you could have nearly up to 20 chicks sometimes, which is incredible. They're a beautiful little bird, plenty of colour, plenty of personality. They love spending time on large broad leaf trees, so that would be deciduous trees. They do visit bird tables for things like peanuts and seeds. But be sure to keep the peanuts within a mesh holder. These birds would be a lovely bird to focus on protecting and helping in your garden if you can. Another lovely bird is this guy here. Can you guess what it is? Well done, it's a great tit. Now in that video clip, it was a little blue tit hopping along on the tree. But what you could hear in the background is a great tit singing. They say, teacher, 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 teacher. So they're easy to spot in the school grounds. So they feed in a very similar way to the blue tit and their way of going about in the garden is quite similar. The only thing is they're a little bit bigger, so they're a little bit heavier than the blue tit. So they tend to feed kind of closer to the tree trunk and on the larger branches, instead of out on the skinny twiggy limbs at the sides of the tree. They, like the blue tit, will take to a nest box if you provide the right one. The hole for the nesting box for the bird to go in and out should be about 28 millimetres in diameter. That's about three millimetres larger than the blue tit hole. I'll tell you a bit more about nest boxes towards the end of this talk. Now, who is this? If you listen closely to the clip I'm about to play, you'll hear a kind of a long melody sung three times. That was once. twice, so did you get that? It was the same melody sung three times, now there are other birds chirping away in the background too, but the melody that this guy sings 
is kind of a falling one. It starts up high and it gradually goes at the end. So I'll play it again and maybe you can pick it out if it wasn't so clear the first time. Did you hear it the three times that time? So that bird is the chaffinch. And like in all the other clips, it was the male singing. The male or the daddy in the chaffinch is again a little bit more colorful than the female. The males sing generally to attract a mate, so to attract a female to come and breed, and also to make all the other birds around know that it's protecting its own nest site and that this is his territory. So they sing loudly to keep other birds away and in a way to boast that they have a wonderful territory in case they're still looking for a mate. Again, the males are more colorful than the females and this is usually because the females are the ones that will sit on the nest. If they're sitting on the nest, they want to hide and blend in they're kind of camouflaged to look the same color as the nest and the branches and the twigs of the tree in which they're nesting. So that if a hunting bird like a sparrow hawk or a buzzard happens to be flying past, that they won't see the nest, they won't find the nest and the eggs and the chicks and the mother will stay safe. So this beautiful bird is one of several finches that will visit a bird feeder easily. In general, they love mature trees, big, big old trees and shrubberies. And they do love a well-stocked bird table. They kind of prefer to feed on the ground or on a table as opposed to hanging on a feeder. And things that they love to eat are sunflower seeds, linseeds and rapeseed. What we have to really consider for these guys is something called trichomoniasis or finch disease. And when we have bird tables, you're making sure that lots of birds are coming together and they're mixing a lot. And so the disease can actually spread a little bit faster. So one thing we have to remember when we are feeding birds is to take care of the feeders and tables themselves. Every couple of weeks, you need to take them in, wash them down with warm, soapy water. Let them dry thoroughly before restocking the most fresh food. But these birds are beautiful and worth feeding. So keep an eye out for them along with their friends, the bullfinch, the greenfinch, and the goldfinch at your bird tables. Now, this is our last one for today. If you listen carefully to this video clip, you will hear a bird repeating itself. It sings a beautiful melody, short melody, it repeats itself. It sings another short melody and repeats itself. And it does this a couple of times during the video clip. So keep an ear out and see if you can pick out the song. There is a lot of other bird noises at the same time, so it might not be so easy. Give it a go, see how you get on. How did you get on? Maybe you want to go back and listen to it again. But what you will notice is that in the distance there, there is a strong voice singing a melody, it repeats itself. Then it sings a different melody and repeats itself. And it does that a couple more times. And that is the song thrush. It's like it's singing a song. So that's why it's called a song thrush. We have another thrush species in Ireland called the missile thrush, which is a good bit bigger and unlikely to spend too much time in your garden compared to the song thrush. The song thrush are a bit more common. But do check it out and see if you think you have a thrush, try and make sure you correctly identify which one it is. The song thrush has a very seasonal diet, so it changes its diet throughout the year. In winter, it prefers worms, which it picks out from lawns and leaf litter, a bit like the blackbird we talked about earlier. In the spring and summer, it'll eat a lot of animals like insects, 
such as caterpillars, beetles, and other little grubs. And then in late summer, it will eat snails. And in autumn, fruit and berries are its favorite. If you're not sure if you have these birds on your school grounds, you may look out for one of their telltale signs, and that is the anvil stone. So as I said, in the autumn time, these birds love to eat snails, but they don't like to eat the shells. So in order to eat the soft snail body parts inside, they will find a preferred stone, their favorite stone, and they'll crack the shells on the stone until the shell, hard shell, falls off. They'll then eat the inside of the snail's body. So if you find lots of broken snail shell beside a stone on your school ground somewhere, the chances are it was a song thrush that was there feeding away and using the stone that you found covered in shells as its anvil stone. Now, a few general points about feeding and caring for birds. Food shortages can occur at any time of the year. By feeding all year round, you'll give the birds a better chance of surviving. In autumn and winter, put out food and water on a regular basis. In severe weather, feed them even twice a day, especially if there's snow and they really can't access any other food. Birds require higher energy foods during the cold winter weather to keep their fat reserves and to survive the frosty nights. Make sure you use only good quality food and food scraps. Keep an eye on what they're taking, and if it's starting to disappear faster than usual, put out more. If less is being taken than you expected, remember to clear it up. Don't let uneaten food accumulate around feeders. You'll only get rats and other vermin. Once you establish a feeding routine, try not to change it as the birds will become used to it and they will time their visits to your garden in accordance. If food shortages occur when birds have young in the nest, they may be tempted to take the food from bird tables and bird feeders to the nest, even if it's not suitable. So never put out loose peanuts, dry hard foods, large chunks of bread or fats during the spring or summer months so that young chicks will survive. In spring and summer, birds require high protein foods so that they can grow their new feathers. So only feed selected foods at this time of year. Read up on the RSPB website, that's the Royal Society for the Protection of Bird website. They give a very detailed breakdown of what's good and what's not so good throughout the year. If you feel you must put out peanuts, only do so in suitable mesh feeders that will not allow sizable pieces of peanuts to be taken away, reducing the risk of choking to chicks. The feeding birds, things to look out for. Place feeders up high and close to cover. So if you put the feeders out in the middle of a field, birds are unlikely to use them. Place the feeders close to trees and other cover so that they have a place to hide if a hunting bird comes in, such as a sparrow hawk. Keep the feeders up high as well so that it's not easy for cats to predate the birds feeding. Think about who and what you're hoping to feed. So think of the species of birds you're hoping to support and help with the food and be very selective in what food you put out. Ensure that you're putting out good food in the right container. Again, go to the RSPB website for specific information on this. Remember to clean your feeders regularly. In terms of nest boxes, there's a fair bit to know, but for the best advice, go to Birdwatch Ireland or the RSPB website. Things that are very important and need to be considered include the size of the hole for accessing the box, the shape of the box overall, the position of the box when it is being put up in relation to the prevailing wind and the sunshine. Birds will get Chicks and eggs will, will get too cold if the open side of the nest box faces the prevailing wind and eggs and chicks will overheat if the nest is in direct sunlight. 
do not rely on the beautiful online images of nest boxes for your plants. Be scientific about it and go to Birdwatch Ireland or the RSPB websites.